It is a thrill to be here at a, at a conference that's devoted to Inspired by Nature, you can imagine. Um, and I'm also thrilled to be in the foreplay section. Did you notice this section is foreplay? Because I get to talk about one of my favorite critters, which is the Western Grebe. You haven't lived until you've seen these guys do their courtship dance. I was on Bowman Lake in Glacier National Park, which is a long, skinny lake with sort of mountains upside down in it. And my partner and I have a rowing shell. And so we were rowing, and one of these Western Grebes came along. And what they do for their courtship dance is they, they go together, the two of them, the two mates, and they begin to run underwater. They paddle faster and faster and faster until they're going so fast that they literally lift up out of the water and they're standing upright, sort of paddling the top of the water. And one of these grebes came along while we were rowing. And so we're in a, we're in a skull and we're moving really, really quickly. And this grebe, I think, sort of mistaked us for uh, a prospect and started to run along the water next to us in a courtship dance for miles. Would stop and then start and then stop and then start. Now that is foreplay. <laughs> okay? I almost, I came this close to changing species at that moment. Obviously, life can teach us something in the entertainment section, okay? Life has a lot to teach us, but what I'd like to talk about today is what life might teach us in technology and in design. What's happened since the book came out, the book was mainly about research in biomimicry, and what's happened since then is architects, designers, engineers, people who make our world have started to call and say, we want a biologist to sit at the design table to help us in real time become inspired, or, and this is the fun part for me, we want you to take us out into the natural world. We'll come with a design challenge and we find the champion adapters in the natural world who might inspire us. So this is a picture from a Galapagos trip that we took with some wastewater treatment engineers. They purify wastewater. And some of them were very resistant, actually, to being there. What they said to us at first was, you know, we already do biomimicry. We use bacteria to clean our water. And we said, well, it's not exactly, that's not exactly being inspired by nature. That's bioprocessing. You know, that's bioassisted technologies. Using an organism to do your wastewater treatment is an old, old technology called domestication. This is learning something, learning an idea from an organism, and then applying it. And so they still weren't getting it. Um, so we went for a walk on the beach. And I said, well, give me one of your big problems. Give me a design challenge, sustainability speed bump that's keeping you from being sustainable. And they said scaling, which is the buildup of minerals inside of pipes. And they said, you know, what happens is mineral, just like at your house, mineral builds up and the aperture closes and we have to flush the pipes with toxins or we have to dig them up. So if we had some way to stop this scaling, and so I picked up some shells on the beach. And I asked them, what is scaling? What's inside your pipes? And they said, calcium carbonate. And I said, that's what this is. This is calcium carbonate. And they didn't know that. They didn't know that what, what a seashell is, it's templated by proteins, and then ions from the seawater crystallize in place okay, to create a shell. So the same sort of a process, without the proteins, is happening on the inside of their pipes. They didn't know. This is not for lack of information. It's, the, it's a lack of integration. You know, it's the silo, people in silos. They didn't know that the same thing was happening. So one of them thought about it and said, okay, well, if this is just crystallization that happens automatically out of seawater, self-assembly, then why aren't shells infinite in size? What, what stops, stops the scaling? scaling? Why don't they just... Go ahead. You... 了解他在讲的意思,就是说,那个贝壳是一个蛋白质做底,然后拿海水,就是他的海水去变成他的 
硬壳。那这个跟我们在管子里面结晶的程序是一样，可是我们的管子结晶就越结越多，越结到最后把管子堵起来。可是贝壳为什么不会？因为海水一直在旁边越来越大，然后变成无限大呢？那 Why don't they just keep on going? And I said, well, the same way that they let go of protein and start the crystallization, and then they also sort of lead in. They let go of protein that stops the crystallization, it literally adheres to the growing face of the crystal. And in fact, there is a product called TPA that's mimicked that protein, that stop protein, and it's an environmentally friendly way to stop scaling. That changed, that changed everything. From, From then on, you could, could not get these engineers back in the boat. The first, the first day, they, they would take a hike, and, and it was click, 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 click. Five, five minutes later, later they were back in the boat. boat. We're, we're done. done. You know, you know, I've, I've seen, seen that, that island. island. After this, they were, they were crawling, crawling all over. They would, not, they they would snorkel, snorkel for as long as we would let them snorkel. What, what had happened, happened was, was that they realized that there were organisms, organisms out there that, that had already solved problems that they had spent their careers trying to solve. Learning about the natural world is one thing. Learning, Learning from, from the natural world, world that's, that's the switch. switch. That's the profound switch. What they, they realized was that the answer to their, their questions are everywhere. They just, they just needed to change the lenses with which, which they saw the world. world. 3.8 billion years of field testing. 10 to 30, Craig Venter will probably tell you, I think there's a lot more than 30 million well-adapted The important thing for me is that these are solutions solved in context. And the context is the Earth, the same context that we're trying to solve our, our, our problems in. So it's the conscious emulation of life's genius. It's not slavishly mimicking, although Al is trying to get the hairdo going. It's not a slavish mimicry. It's taking the design principles, the genius of the natural world, and learning something from it. Now, in a group with so many IT people, I do have to mention that what I'm not going to talk about. And that is that your field is one that has learned an enormous amount from living things on the software side. So, so there's computers, computers that protect themselves, themselves like an immune system, system and we're learning, learning from gene regulation, regulation and biological development and, and, and we're learning, learning from neural nets, genetic, genetic algorithms, algorithms, evolutionary behavior. That's on the software side. side. But what's, what's interesting to me is that we haven't looked, looked at this as, as much. I mean, these machines are really not, not very high tech, tech in my estimation in the sense, sense that there's dozens and dozens of carcinogens in the water in Sun Belt. So the hardware is not at all up to snuff in terms of what life would call a success. So what can we learn about making not just computers but everything? The plane you came in, cars, the seats that you're sitting on. How do we redesign the world that we make, the human made world? More importantly, what should we ask in the next 10 years? There's a lot of technologies out there that life has. What's the syllabus? Three questions for me are key. How does life make things? This is the opposite. This is how we make things. It's called heat, heat, beat, treat. That's what material science is called. And it's called this heat, beat, treat. It means that human beings make things first. They have to heat it up. 然后来拿来打打打打打，然后再 treat， 意思是说，我们像炼钢，我们要造一个很硬的东西，我们要造一个陶，就是陶器的那个陶，也都是一定要先加热。他说自然不是这样，这一段很重要。And it's carving things down from the top with 96% waste left over, and only 4% product. You heat it up, beat it with high pressures, you use chemicals. Okay, heat, beat, and treat. Life can't afford to do that. How does life make things? How does life make the most of things? That's a geranium pollen. And its shape is what gives it the function of being able to tumble through air so easily. Okay, look at that shape. 
life adds information to matter. In other words, structure. It gives it information. By adding information to matter, it gives it a function that's different than without that structure. And thirdly, how does life make things disappear into systems? Because life doesn't really deal in things. There are no things in the natural world divorced from their systems. Really quick syllabus. As I'm, I'm reading more and more now and following this story, there are some amazing things coming up in the biological sciences. And at the same time, I'm listening to a lot of businesses and finding what their sort of grand challenges are. The two groups are not talking to each other at all. What in the world of biology might be helpful at this juncture to get us through this sort of evolutionary knot that we're in? I'm going to try to go through 12 really quickly. Okay, one that's exciting to me is self-assembly. Now you've heard about this in, in, in terms of nanotechnology. Back to that shell. The shell is a self-assembling material. On the lower left there is a picture of mother of pearl forming out of seawater. It's a layered structure that's mineral and then polymer, and it makes it very, very tough. It's twice as tough as our high-tech ceramics. But what's really interesting...贝壳是比我们的高科技的陶瓷高科技陶瓷现在来做很多东西硬两倍的东西但是它不需要一个工厂它就是自己靠自己小小的那个东西就在自己制造了一个它需要的壳这个概念就是让我们做设计的人去了
a guy named Jeff Coates at Cornell said to himself, you know, plants do not see CO2 as the biggest poison of our time. We see it that way. Plants are busy making long chains of starches and glucose, right, out of CO2. He's found a way, he's found a catalyst, and he's found a way to take CO2 and make it into polycarbonates, biodegradable plastics out of CO2. How plant-like. Solar transformations. The most exciting one, there are people who are mimicking the energy harvesting device inside of purple bacterium, the people at ASU. Even more interesting lately, in the last couple of weeks, people have seen that there's an enzyme called a hydrogenase that's able to evolve hydrogen from proton and electrons and is able to take hydrogen up. Basically what's happening in a fuel cell, in the anode of a fuel cell, in a reversible fuel cell, in our fuel cells we do it with platinum, Life does it with a very, very common iron. And a, a team has now just been able to mimic that hydrogen juggling hydrogenase. That's very exciting for fuel cells, to be able to do that without platinum. Power of shape, here's a whale. We've seen that the fins of this whale have tubercles on them, and those little bumps actually increase efficiency in, for instance, the edge of an airplane, increase efficiency by about 32%, which is an amazing fossil fuel savings, if we were just to put that on the, on the edge of a wing. Color without pigments, this peacock is creating color with shape. Light comes through, it bounces back off the layers. It's called thin film interference. Imagine being able to self-assemble products with the last few layers playing with light to create color. Imagine being able to create a shape on the outside of a surface so that it's self-cleaning with just water. That's what a leaf does. See that up-close picture? It's a ball of water, and those are dirt particles, and that's an up-close picture of a lotus leaf. There's a company making a product called Lotusin, which mimics when the building facade paint dries, it mimics the bumps in a self-cleaning leaf and rainwater cleans the building. Water is going to be our big grand challenge. Quenching thirst. Here are two organisms that pull water. The one on the left is the Namibian beetle pulling water out of fog. The one on the right is a pill bug pulls water out of air. Does not drink fresh water. Pulling water out of Monterey fog and out of the sweaty air in Atlanta before it gets into a building are key technologies. Separation technologies are going to be extremely important. What if we were to say no more hard rock mining? What if we were to separate out metals from waste streams? Small amounts of metals in water. That's what microbes do. They chelate metals out of water. There's a company here in San Francisco called MR3 that is embedding mimics of the microbes molecules on filters to mine waste streams. Green chemistry is chemistry in water. We do chemistry in organic solvents. This is a picture of the spinnerets coming out of a spider, okay, and the silk being formed from a spider. Isn't that beautiful? Green chemistry is replacing our industrial chemistry with nature's recipe book. It's not easy because life uses only a subset of the elements in the periodic table. And we use all of them, even the toxic ones. To figure out the elegant recipes that would take the small subset of the periodic table and create miracle materials like that silk is the task of green chemistry. Timed degradation, packaging, that is good until you don't want it to be good anymore and dissolves on cue. That's a muscle you can find in the water. Yeah. 早上你在喝牛奶, 我不是说那个packaging一定会改, 意思就是说你可能吃完的时候, 那个包包就要自动, 那个装面包的东西也要自动不见, 那个才行, 不然你还要找个地方去丢. Fine waters out here. And the threads holding it to a rock are timed at exactly two years they begin to dissolve. Healing. This is a good one. There's that little guy over there. 
is a tardigrade. There is a problem with vaccines around the world not getting to patients. And the reason is that the refrigeration somehow gets broken. What's called the cold chain gets broken. A guy named Bruce Rosner looked at the tardigrade, which dries out completely and yet stays alive for months and months and months and is able to regenerate itself. And he found a way to dry out vaccines, encase them in the same sort of sugar capsules as the tardigrade has within its cells, meaning that vaccines no longer need to be refrigerated. They can be put in a glove compartment. Okay? Learning from organisms, this is a session about water, learning about organisms that can do without water in order to create a vaccine that lasts and lasts and lasts without refrigeration. I'm not going to get to 12. But what I am going to do is tell you that the most important thing, besides all of these adaptations, is the fact that these organisms have figured out a way to do the amazing things they do while taking care of the place that's going to take care of their offspring. When they're involved in foreplay, they're thinking about something very, very important, and that's having their genetic material remain 10,000 generations from now. And that means finding a way to do what they do without destroying the place that'll take care of their offspring. That's the biggest design challenge. Luckily, there are millions and millions of geniuses willing to gift us with their best ideas. Good luck having a conversation with them. Thank you.我身边跟大家介绍一下右边的这位他叫做Chris 他每一个人去的时候要交三千多块美金一次在现场我们是看不要钱的那边坐在现场那些人都是要交那么多钱去所以他让他变得非常非常成功所以现在也变成是一个知识传递的地方 talk about, talk about foreplay, I, I, we need to get to 12, but really quickly it's like, oh, really? Yeah, just like, you know, like the, the 10 second version of 10, 11 and 12 because we just, your slides are so gorgeous and the ideas are so big I can't stand to let you go down without right, seeing 10, well, 11, or 12. Put this back. Okay, I'll just hold this thing. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so that's the healing one. Um, sensing and responding, feedback is a huge thing. This is a locust. There are going to be 80 million of them in a square kilometer, and yet they don't collide with one another. And yet we have 3.6 million car collisions a year. <laughs> right? There's a person at Newcastle who has figured out that it's a very large neuron, and, and she's actually figuring out how to make a collision avoidance circuitry based on this very large neuron in the locust. This is a huge and important one, number 11, and that's the growing fertility. That means, you know, net fertility farming. We should be growing fertility, and oh yes, we get food too, because we have to grow the capacity of this planet to create more and more opportunities for life. And really, that's what other organisms do as well. In ensemble, that's what whole ecosystems do. They create more and more opportunities for life. Our farming has done the opposite. So farming based on how a prairie builds soil, ranching based on how a native ungulate herd actually increases the health of the range, even wastewater treatment based on how a marsh not only cleans the water, but creates incredibly sparkling productivity. This is the simple design brief. I mean, it looks simple because the system over 3.8 billion years has worked this out. That is, 
those organisms that have not been able to figure out how to enhance or sweeten their places are not around to tell us about it. That's the twelfth one. Life, and this is the secret trick, this is the magic trick, life creates conditions conducive to life. It builds soil, it cleans air, it cleans water, it mixes the cocktail of gases that you and I need to live, and it does that in the middle of having great foreplay <laughs> and meeting their needs. So it's, it's not mutually exclusive. We have to find a way to meet our needs while making of this place an Eden. Thank you, sir. So, if you are interested in design, you must avoid a thought that when I make something, I must destroy another thing. Because even we feel like it is a bird, 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 a 所以这也是 Ken Robins 呃 Robinson 他刚刚说的，呃，他说，如果所有的昆虫死掉，人类会在五十年之之间消失。可是如果人类全部死光光，所有的全世界都会繁荣起来。可见人类是一个破坏力很大的东西。我们要设计东西，特别要特别要注意到这个。我们的时间不多，现在十一点二十。那为了要让我们在十二点钟可以结束，我们现在进行的呃下一段<咳>，我就简单的问几个问题，请教一下刚刚我还没有问过的同。同学，看完这个影片以后，你感受最深的是哪一个 idea？ 他刚刚很快的说了十二个 idea。你要不要说一下？呃，我觉得，其实看完这影片，我觉得他刚刚有提到，就是呃，我们与大自然生存，就是如何互相就是呃相处的方式。我觉得，其实我们就是在日常生活中做任何设计，因为我之前有看过另外一本书，它是提到关于设计与大自然互相制衡的关系。它叫那本书叫《Cradle Cradle to Cradle》，就是摇篮到摇篮设计。我觉得。就是我们在做任何一步这种时间，我们都想到说之后会产生什么样的事情。那我们可能说，像现在大家可能常常提到说，学校可能会常常提到做回收或什么之类的。那我们到底做的是怎么样的回收？是是百分之百回收，还是一种呃降一等级的回收？那是我觉得在刚开始最初的设计的时候就要先想思考到的事情。所以我觉得呃，可能我们现在。做设计对未来都会有非常大的影响，所以在那第一步的时候就要想清楚，说这个东西最后会产生什么样的影响，都要思考清楚。这样，很好。你让我想起来，我在大三的时候，那时候我帮一位呃大四的同学赶他的图，那我就在画瓷砖啊。那时候我们画图不是像各位现在用电脑画，我们是用手，然后用一个尺在那边弄。那所以要画瓷砖，其实其实很难画，不是像现在我们有一个 pattern， 噗就这样这样贴过去。所以我要一块一块把它画出来。可是我一块一块画出来的时候，我就跑去问他，我说：“哎、欸，我们这样画，他就是以后做的人是不是这样做啊？”啊，那他告诉我说：“是哎、欸。”那我想说：“哎、欸，那我们画都这么累，那他做不是累死他？”那其实同样的道理，如果我们可以去想说，我们在做设计的时候，就像你刚刚说的。我们在做设计的时候，其实回回过头去想，我们创造了多少垃圾，我们创造了多少什么东西啊？那个在过去的那个时代还没有办法解决，可是这个时代，也就是你们的时代，它已经可以解决了。谢谢你的答案。你刚刚有回答过我的问题吗？你要不要分享一下？我觉得就是他刚刚有讲到一个回馈的机制啊。然后还有，就是他让我我，然后他也举个例子是说车祸的那件事情，然后我就想到说，其实就是上一节课在讲，就是就是人类可能每个人都有自己希望的事情，可是人类会有一直有一个问题在打转，就是每个人的每个人希望的事情中间是有冲突的，所以就是当有回馈或反应机制的时候，其实
人跟人之间，就是在想到你自己想做的事情的时候，他会有一个缓冲的空间，就是让人跟人所以不会撞在一起。对，就是我我想，如果车祸这件事情可以解决，说不定我不知道有没有办法，就是就是有很多问题都说不定也可以解决，因为我觉得人跟人最大的问题就是在相处或者是磨合中间会有一些。就因为自己的利益，然后没有办法，就是相处的问题。好，很好的解释。其实每一个人只要稍微让一下，他就不会撞在一起。再两个，来，林贵信，徐，徐，我也是对蝗虫那个回馈机制有蛮大的兴趣，因为它。它其实就是一个已经很存在已久的现象，就在那边。然后我们却创造了就车祸这个现象，然后在这里困惑了很久，然后反而要回头去寻找它已经存在的答案。就是答案或许是，就是不是去设计，然后去做出来，反反而是回头寻找这样。很好。呃，你看得到吗？这么后面看,看不太清楚。哎、欸，所以以后可以坐到前面。啊，那但是你还是要回答。啊，就是就一个，就是要如何跟大自然，就是不会做什么伤害到大自然，要如何去，应该是人类要如何去，怎，要怎么样？就是要。不是要去这样子，你你你你学什么？哲学。哲学。对。很好，以后大家都是靠你。就是不是要想清楚？你想清楚，大家就想清楚了。没有啊，不是要去征服大自然，是要去顺从大自然。你有读过老子吗？没，还没。哦，还没。对。我们，你读过老子以后，我们开始来谈这个问题。接下来。我们节省时间，让大家看一个大家可能会觉得更有兴趣的东西。刚刚的那个影片，我非常喜欢看，其实我已经看了很多次，但是我每一次看的时候都觉得非常的有很多的很多的触动。那这个呢，事实上是一个很年轻的人，他做的是这个，各位可能会有兴趣，他在一个。电脑里面去模拟人的神经系统，然后开始去让虚拟的人看起来像是一个真人。那么，也许我们会觉得说，那那这个干嘛？就只能做做电动玩具。虽然它是一个很大的生意，不过，呃，只做这样吗？其实不是，它开始变成让外科的手术的医生可以用他做出来这些假人去模仿他的手术的时候。到底会发生什么事情？我们来看一下，然后就差不多做一个讨论，可以结束今天的课程。I'm going to talk about a technology that we're developing at Oxford now. That we think is going to change the way that computer games and Hollywood movies、um, are being made.、Um, that technology is、um, simulating humans. It's simulated humans with a simulated body and a simulated nervous system to control that body.、Um, now, before I talk more about that、um, technology,、um, let's have a quick look at what、uh, human characters look like at the moment in computer games. Now, this is a clip from a game called、uh, Grand Theft Auto 3. We already saw that briefly yesterday, and what you can see is, it is actually a very good game. It's one of the most successful games of all times. But what you'll see is that all the animations in this game are very, very repetitive. They pretty much look the same. I've made him run into a wall here over and over again, and you can see it looks always the same. The reason for that is,、um, is that these characters are actually not real characters. They are a Um, graphical visualization of a character.、Um, to produce these animations, an animator at、um, a studio has to anticipate、um, what's going to happen、um, in the actual game, and then has to animate、um, that particular sequence. So he or she sits down 
animates it, um, tries to anticipate what's going to happen, and then these particular animations are just played back at appropriate times um, in the computer game. Now, the result of that is that um, you can't have real interactivity. All you have is animations that are played back at more or less um, the appropriate times. It also means that games um, aren't really going to be as surprising as they could be because um, you only get out of it, at least in terms of the character, what you actually put into it. There's no real emergence there. And thirdly, as I said, uh, most of the animations um, look very repetitive because of that. Now, the only way to get around that is to actually simulate the human body and to simulate um, that bit of the nervous system of the brain that controls that body. And maybe if I could have you for a quick demonstration to show what the difference is. Because, <laughs> I mean, very, very, um, it's very trivial. Um, if I push Chris a bit like this, for example, he'll react to it. If I push him from a different angle, he'll react to it differently. And that's because he has a physical body and because um, he has the motor skills to control that body. It's a very trivial thing. It's not something you get in computer games at the moment at all. Thank you very much. That's it? That's it, yeah. So that's exactly... That's what we're trying to simulate. Uh, not Chris specifically, I should say, but um, human in general. Um, now, we started working on this um, a while ago at Oxford uh, University, and we tried to start very simply. What we tried to do was teach a stick figure on how to walk. Um, that stick figure is physically simulated. You can see it here on the screen. So um, it's subject to gravity, has joints, etc. So if you just run the simulation, it'll just collapse like this. Um, the tricky bit is now to put um, a controller, AI control, in it that actually makes it work. And for that, we used a neural network, which we based on um, that part of the nervous system that we have in our spine um, that controls walking in humans. It's called the central pattern generator. So we simulated that as well. And then the really tricky bit is, is to teach that network how to walk. Um, for that, we used artificial evolution, um, genetic algorithms. We heard about those um, already yesterday, and I suppose that most of you are familiar with that already. But just briefly, the concept is, is that you create um, a large number of different um, individuals, neural networks in this case, all of which are random at the beginning. You hook these up, in this case, to the virtual muscles of that um, two-legged creature here and um, hope that it does something interesting. At the beginning, they're all going to be... Um, very boring. Most of them won't move at all, but some of them might make a tiny step. Those are then selected by the algorithm, uh, reproduced with mutation and um, recombination, so you introduce sex as well, and you repeat that process over and over again until you have something that walks, in this case, in a straight line like this. So what, that was the idea behind this. When we started this, I set up the simulation um, one evening. It took about three to four hours um, to run the simulation. Got up the next morning, um, went to the computer, um, and looked at the result and was hoping for something that walked in a straight line, like I just demonstrated. And this is what I got instead. <laughs> so um, it was uh, back to the drawing board for us. Um, we did get it to work uh, eventually, um, after tweaking uh, bits here and there. And this is an example of a successful evolutionary run. So that what you'll see in a moment is um, a very simple biped that's learning how to walk using artificial evolution. At the, at the beginning, it can't walk at all, but it'll get better and better over time. So this is the one that can't walk at all. Now, after five generations of applying an evolutionary process, a genetic algorithm is getting a tiny bit better. <laughs> Generation 10, and it'll take a few steps more. Still not quite there. But now, after Generation 20, it actually walks in a straight line without falling over. That was a real breakthrough for us. It was academically quite a challenging project, and once we had reached that stage, we were quite confident that we could um, try and do other things as well um, with, with this approach, actually simulating the body and simulating that part of the nervous system that controls it. Now, at this stage, it also became clear that this could be very exciting for things like computer games or online worlds. So what you see here is the character standing there, and there's an obstacle in his way that we put in its way. And what you see is, it's going to fall over the obstacle. Now, the interesting bit is if I move the obstacle a tiny bit to the right, which is what I'm doing now here, it'll fall over it in a completely different way. And again, if you move the obstacle a tiny bit, it'll again fall differently. 
<laughs> now, well, you see, by the way, in the, um, at the top there are some of the neural activations being fed into the virtual muscles. OK, that's the video. Thanks. Now, this might look kind of trivial, but it's actually very important, because this is not something you get at the moment in any interactive or any virtual worlds. Now, at this stage, we, we decide to start a company and move this further, because obviously this was just a very simple blocky biped. What we really wanted was a full human body. So um, we started the company. Um, we hired a team of um, physicists, software engineers, and biologists to work on this. And the first thing we had to work on was to create the human body, basically. Uh, it's got to be relatively fast, so you can run it on a normal machine, but it's got to be accurate enough that it looks good enough, basically. So um, we put a quite a bit of biomechanical knowledge into this thing. Um, and made it, try to make it as realistic as possible. What you see here on the screen right now is, is a very simple visualization of that body. Um, should add that um, it's very simple to add things like hair, clothes, etc. Um, but what we've done here is um, use a very simple, simple visualization so you can concentrate on the movement. Now, what I'm going to do right now um, in, a, in a moment is just push this character a tiny bit and we'll see what happens. Nothing really interesting, basically. It folds over, but it folds over like a rag doll, basically. The reason for that is, is that there's no intelligence in it. It becomes interesting when you put artificial intelligence into it. So this character now has um, motor skills in the upper body. Um, nothing in the legs yet in this particular one. But what it will do, I'm going to push it again. It will realize autonomously that it's being pushed. It's going to stick out its hands, and it's going to turn around into the fold and try and catch the fold. So that's what you're seeing here. Now, it gets really interesting if you then add the AI for the lower part of the body as well. So here we've got the same character. I'm going to push it a bit harder um, now, harder than I just pushed push Chris. But what you'll see is, so again, it's going to receive a push now from, from the left. What you see is it takes steps backwards. It tries to counterbalance. It tries to look at the place where it thinks it's going to land. I'll show you this again and then finally hits the floor. Now, this becomes really exciting um, when you push that character in different directions. Again, just as I've done. Um, that's, where, that's something that you cannot do right now. At the moment, you only have um, empty computer graphics in, in, uh, in games. But this is now is a real simulation. That's what I want to show you now. So here's the same character with the same behavior I've just shown you. But now I'm just going to push it from different directions. First, starting with a push from the right. This is all slow motion, by the way, so we can see what's going on. Now, the angle will have changed a tiny bit, so you can see that the reaction is different. Again, a push, now this time from the front. And you see it falls differently, and now from the left. And it falls differently. That was really exciting for us to see that. Um, that was the first time we've seen that. This is, by the way, the first time the public sees this as well, because we have been in stealth mode. I haven't shown this to anybody yet. Um, now, just a fun thing, what happens if you put that character, this is now a wooden version of it, but it's got the same eye in it, what if you put that character um, on a slippery surface like ice? We just did that for a laugh, just to see what happens. <laughs> and this is what happens. Oh <laughs> it's nothing we had to do about this. We just took this character that I just talked about, put it on a slippery surface, and this is what you get out of it. And that's a really fascinating thing about this approach. Um, now, when we went to um, film studios and games developers and, and showed them that technology, um, got a very good response. And what they said was, the first thing they need immediately is virtual stuntmen. Um, because stunts are obviously very dangerous, they're very expensive, and there are a lot of stunt scenes that you cannot do, obviously, because you can't really allow the, um, the stuntman to be seriously hurt. So they wanted to have a digital version of a stuntman, and that's what we've been working on for the past few months, and that's our first um, product that we're going to uh, release in, in a couple of weeks. So here are just a few very simple scenes of the guy just being kicked. That's what people want, that's what we're giving them. <laughs> You can see it's always reacting. This is not a dead body. This is a body who basically, in this particular case, feels the force and tries to protect its head. And here, I think, it's quite a big blow again. You feel kind of sorry for that thing. And we've, we've seen it so many times now, we don't really care anymore. But, 
There are much worse videos than this, by the way, which I have taken out. But uh, <laughs> um, now here's another one. Um, what people wanted um, as a behavior was to have a, a, an explosion, a, a strong force applied to the character, and have the character react to it in midair, so that you don't have a character that looks limp, but actually a character that you can use in an action film straight away that looks kind of alive in midair as well. So this character is going to be hit by a force. It's going to realize it's in the air, and it's going to try and um, well, stick out its arm in the direction where it's landing. That's one angle. Here's another angle. We now think that the realism we're achieving with this is, is good enough to be used in films. And let's just have a look at a slightly different visualization. This is something I just got last night from an animation studio in London who are using our software and um, experimenting with it right now. Um, so this is exactly the same behavior that you saw, um, but in a slightly better rendered version. So, if you look at the character carefully, you see there are lots of body movements going on, none of which you have to animate like in the old days. An animator had to actually animate them. This is all happening automatically in the simulation. This is a slightly different angle. And again, a slow motion version of this. This is incredibly quick. This is happening in real time. You can run the simulation in real time in front of your eyes, change it if you want to, and you get the animation straight out of it. At the moment, doing something like this by hand would take you probably a couple of days. This is another behavior they requested. I'm not quite sure why, but we've done it anyway. It's a very simple behavior that shows you the power of this approach. In this case, the character's hands are fixed to a particular point in space. And all we've taught the character is to struggle. And you, it looks organic. It looks realistic. You feel kind of sorry for the guy. It's even worse. And this is another video I just got last night, if you uh, render that a bit more realistically. Now, I'm showing this to you just to show you the, how organic it actually can feel, how realistic it can look. And this is all a physical simulation of the body using AI to drive virtual mus muscles in that body. Now, one thing we just did for a laugh was to create a slightly more complex stunt scene. And one of the most famous stunts is the one where James Bond uh, jumps off a dam in Switzerland um, and then is caught by a, caught by a bungee. I've um, got a sh very short clip here. Yeah, you can just about see it here. Um, in this case, they were using a real stunt. It was, it was a very dangerous stunt. It was just voted, I think, in the Sunday Times as one of the most impressive stunts. Now, we've just tried and looked at our character and asked ourselves, can we do that ourselves as well? Can we use a physical simulation of the character, use artificial intelligence, put that artificial intelligence into the character, drive virtual muscles, simulate the way he jumps off the dam, and then um, skydive afterwards and have him caught by a bungee um, afterwards. We did that. It took about altogether just two hours pretty much to create the simulation. And that's what it looks like here. Now this could do with a bit more work. It's still very early stages and we pretty much just did this for a laugh just to see what we get out of it. But what we found over the past few months is that this, this approach and that we pretty much stumbled upon is is incredibly powerful. We are ourselves surprised what you actually get out of, um, out of the simulations. There's very often very surprising behavior that, that you didn't predict before. And there's so many things we can do with this right now. Um, the first thing, as I said, is going to be virtual stuntmen. Um, several studios are using the software now to produce virtual stuntmen. And they're going to hit the screen um, quite soon, actually, for, for some major productions. Um, the second thing is um, video games. Uh, with this technology, video games will look different and they will feel very different. For the first time, you'll have actors that really feel very interactive, that have a real body that really react. Um, I think that's going to be incredibly exciting, um, it's probably starting with sports games, which are going to become much more interactive. Um, but I particularly am really excited about using this technology in, in online worlds, uh, like there, for example, that Tom Elcher has shown us. The degree of interactivity you're going to get is totally different, I think, from what you're getting right now. Um, a third thing uh, we are looking at and very interested in is, is um, simulation. Um, we've been approached by several simulation companies, but one project we're particularly excited about, which we're starting next month, is to use our technology, in particular the walking technology, uh, to help aid surgeons who work on children with um, cerebral palsy um, to predict the outcome of operations on these children. Uh, as you probably know, the um, it's very difficult to predict what the outcome of, a, of an operation is if you try and correct the gate. Um, the classic quote is, it's, I think it's unpredictable at best, is what people think right now, uh, is the outcome. Now, what we want to do with our software is allow um, 
our surgeons to have a tool, um, we're going to simulate the, the gait of a particular child, and the surgeon can then work on that simulation and try out different ways to improve that gait before he actually commits to, to an actual surgery. That's one project we're, we're particularly excited about, and that's going to start next month. Um, just finally, um, this is only just the beginning. We can only do several behaviors right now. The AI isn't good enough to simulate a full human body. Um, well, the body, yes, but not all the motor skills that we have. And I think we're only there if we can have something like ballet dancing. Right now, we don't have that, but I'm very sure that we will be able to do that at some stage. Um, we do have one unintentional dancer, actually, which I just, the last thing I wanted to show you. Uh, this was an AI controller that was produced and evolved, half evolved, I should say, to produce balance, basically. So you kick the guy, and um, the guy is supposed to counterbalance. That's what we thought was going to come out of this, uh, but this is what emerged out of it in the end. Thrill seeker, heartbreaker, a shape shifter, a secret keeper. You know what? Bizarrely, this thing doesn't have a head. I'm not quite sure why, but. So this was not something we actually put in there. He just started to. Create that dance himself. It's actually a better dancer than I am, I have to say. And what you see after a while, I think he even goes into a climax right at the end. And I think... There you go. So that all happened automatically. We didn't put that in there. That's just the simulation creating this itself, basically. So it's... Uh... Thanks. I've... Not quite John Travolta yet, but um, we're working on that as well. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Thanks. Incredible. That was really incredible. Thanks. I'm going to share with you a story that recently happened. Last week, when I was in China, I went to Sichuan. I had a friend who was building two schools there. 我就去帮他做这个设计的事情，但是我看到有很多人原件的时候啊，都做得非常的好。我在九七年去呃帮慈济做几个学校的时候，那时候乡下是非常穷的，可是这一次去的时候，我看到的是其实乡下不穷，很相当的富足，所以有很多的教室事实上做的都比这个好。小学哦<咳>，所以我在做设计的时候就开始想到说，哎，一直没有看到生态被用在校园里头<咳>，所以我就开始去让学校、呃、教育单位试着去重视生态<咳>，大家都很重视，可是大家其实都有一个困难，都说那个很难。保养起来也很困难，所以我就从台湾找了一位朋友去帮他<咳>。那我跟大家要分享的事情是这一位，他其实就在彰化。如果我们以后有时间，可以去看他的地方。他的地方晚上你去的时候，他就是一个非常自然的，其实就很像东海这样子的一个自然，但他没有蚊子。大家坐在那里开会的时候没有蚊子，那。但我们的想法当然是说，那他就是用了很多杀虫剂、蚊香啊什么，他说都没有，他里面一点点农药、一点点药都没有用。那为什么没有蚊子？<咳>我就问他。那以下我要跟各位讲的，其实就是要告诉大家说，生态并不一定要像刚刚我们前段的那个影片一样，那么高科技才可以做到。他说所有的东西都是他自己做的，他怎么做呢？<咳>他说：“要没有蚊子，就要知道蚊子哪里来。那蚊子来一定是有水，那那个水呢，一定是啊、呃、这个不动，而且是悠扬。那我就说，那那个水是不是要循环？”他说：“他为了要让能源不要用这个人工的能源去做马达，所以他也让那池水就是不动的。”那我说：“不动为什么会没有蚊子呢？”他说。整个的生态就是这样子，他的做法其实很简单，他就是让那个水里头虽然不动，可是他养了很多，他他不是养，他就是让那个水变成他种了很多的水生植物，水底的、水边的、水上的水生植物
，因为有了水生植物，所以有很多的微生物跟昆虫要来。因为有了这些微生物跟昆虫，所以让那个水就不会悠扬，那决绝就不是一个好的环境去生长。那它还是会生长，可是因为它控制在一个数量底下。而且旁边青蛙因为没有毒，所以青蛙特别喜欢过来，所以它在整个的生态系统中间，它是自然没有蚊子，而不是去喷洒，所以没有蚊子。那它也在那边跟我们，因为我一直在跟他分享说，那校园要在哪里种什么树，多大等等方向，在那几个钟头的讨论之中，我感觉到，其实如果我们愿意，我们自己的身边。我们就可以用最简单的方法开始去改变。今天的第一堂课，想要跟大家分享的，其实一方面是领着大家一起去想象一个，而且亲眼目睹一个很多人正在想象的二十一世纪。有很多的想象都是来自于二十世纪制造的问题，我们需要去把它不止回复，而且还要让我们的。未来的下一代的下一代，刚刚那位生物学家说，这个 millions of generation 一百万代以后，那个基因还是可以活在一个健康的地方。但是我们的责任特别重大，因为二十世纪人类事实上创造了一个很大的问题。那那也是各位这样子的一个年轻的，对于设计有兴趣的人，最好的责的机会。也是最大的责任，因为如果各位继续的是二十世纪做设计的方法，那的问题只会更糟，不会更好。所以各位在这么年轻的心灵里头，一定要去准备一个一种眼前所有的事情都是可以改变的这样的一个方法，包括我们上课的方式。所以我为什么刚刚告诉我告诉大家我的 email？ 我我也很希望我们的网站慢慢的可以让大家可以在上面愿意把，呃，想要怎么样子改进上课的方法，怎么样子的有哪一些题目很想讨论，都可以在上面变成是一个共同的知识系统。因为就像我今天一直尝试的让各位发言一样，各位的发言只要是真心诚意的发言，一定有它的价值。那个价值是。绝对是创意里面最珍贵的一个东西，那个就是我很想各位从自己的身上发现，你必须发现自己有创意，你才对于你自己的设计有信心。那一个做创意跟设计的人，如果对自己没有信心，那你的路走不下去。所以，与其说这一堂课我要带大家看很多新鲜的东西，不如说。我是想透过很多新鲜的东西，呃，让大家一方面看到世界上那些聪明的人在想些什么问题，以及他们把他们的心放在哪里，以便能够让各位也感受到说，那我可以想什么？所以那个是最重要的。所以我们说我们的课不考试，可是我们会有两次做报告。其实各位可以从现在就可以开始准备。我希望各位做的报告是很短，不要超过十个 page 的 PowerPoint 或者是 Keynote。那但是在那个里头呢，你可以找到一个你真心想要改变的事情，不管它是一个制度，还是一个系统，是一种布料，还是一张椅子，还是一个水平，还是还是一个房子，还是一部车子，随便。但是用那个十张简单的幻灯片。用视觉的方法去说明清楚，说我在想什么，那以便能够跟大家分享。那所以我想，呃，你可以开始去思考你的题目，那它不会变成是一个考试，可是可以变成是你最重要的一个一个思考的训练，而且是最重要去抓到说，我们在今天最早的时候讲，爱因斯坦说用。自己的眼睛去看，用自己的心去感受。那我特别提醒大家说，他没有提到脑，所以不需要用脑想，要用你自己感觉。说我真的很想做这个题目，你在做。那如果你没有很想做的题目，你一定是害怕。所以要知道，我们都会害怕。所以做设计的人，第一关要克服的就是害怕，不能害怕。
，所以你尝试的去面对你真实的感受，那一定不会没有你真心想改变的事情，一定有，你把它藏起来。所以从从呃这个课的九堂的中间呢，我们的那两次报告其实量不多。但是希望每一天你都把它放着思考。那我觉得它的好处会是什么呢？其实我觉得它就像放进去一些化学原料的催化剂一样，它会开始在你其他的课程中间发酵，它会开始让你看事情用一些不同的角度去看、去观察，它会开始让你非常有兴趣的去寻找资料。那这些资料的来源现在在网络上其实非常的容易，这也是为什么我在虽然平常呃。看很多书，我这一次特别要求我自己，绝对不跟各位讲任何一本书，我都告诉大家说，我们都从网络上来看，那因为它也是未来你最容易跟人家分享的一个地方。那大概最后的十分钟，我还是想请教几位同学，说，呃，你希望未来的课是怎么样子上？题目是这个。你还没有回答过我的问题，对不对？你要不要说一下？将来的课要希望怎么上？对。你的问答。我们现在正在做演化的工作。我觉得今天这个问答方式不错，就继续下去。继续下去就是这个生物在这里就停了。我们还有什么可以演化的？听懂，听懂。还有哪一位要分享？后面，他们叫我不可以拿下麦克风，我可不可以走过去？我可不可以放下？不然我要一直指来指去，不好意思。没关系，不用动。你要分享吗？嗯，我。下一堂课，就是下一堂课，大大声一点。就怎么下一堂课怎么上嘛？嗯，我会觉得会，因为毕竟发问的时候，一定还会有，还会有其他人会想要回答，但是会怕，就可能自信不足，会不敢分享。我会觉得，我不知道会不会有那种可能是，可以小组讨论之后，共同在，可以发表于黑板上之类的，看一些写出一些。有时候会让人家觉得很惊奇的答案之类，这是我的想法。你要不要这样做？啊？你要不要这样做？可以啊。下个礼拜你主持一,一段。<笑>你是谁？呃，黄博祥。啊？黄博祥。黄，嗯、我讲真的哈，下个礼拜我们的课你就主持一段。你大声一点，不然别人没听到。呃，说可以，或许可以离开教室去其他地方去。哦，换个地方，意思就是我们在树下。就都可以的，然后就随地取材。OK， 这个我要想想看，我要想想看怎么怎么应付投影的问题。在两位。没有必要改变就没有演化。我们现在是在强迫演化。到现在还想不到，就是，如果是你，你会，你会改哪个地方？这样讲，这样讲，你会不会觉得你离这个远了一点？会，会吧。那你要不要想下礼拜，我们就把桌椅变成只有一半的那么多排？我
，这个啊，有没有好处嘛？有没有好处？有有好处，有好处，对嘛？所以这个至少是可以改变的。最后一位 ，Hello。一只太阳座，就是教师，比如说像我们建筑系管大厅那种，算还蛮适合，就是大家离积木都蛮近的。那其实抄笔记就抄在，就是手上拿一本册子就好。你说建筑系玩平图那里啊？对啊对啊。然后我觉得是不是用那个网络？网络教学落地也还不错，就是你的意思就叫我不要来了？没有没有，因为我后来觉得好像我只要来会比较好。可是网络有一个好处是，大家一边看着影片，然后一边可能旁边有个留言板，就开始一直留言，一直留言，大家比较会一直乱讲。OK， 说不定我们在九堂课上完以前已经可以有试试看这样子做。OK， 还有没有人要说？如果没有人要说话，我们最后还有六分钟。我们主任跟院长都在，可不可以请给我们一点点鼓励？呃，要是你每次在上课之后出一个什么样的问题，让我们同学去用眼、用心去碰出那个问题，下一次上课的时候，答题好了以后，这也改变我们对于过去的看法。或者我们怎么想，我们怎么说东西，我们在甚至可以去做一做，每一次有这样的一个作业，让同学去看，让同学去想，是不是有一点这个这个这个实际性更高一点？好，了解，我来想想看，设计一下。中一个原因是在原来的设想里面，上课的环境可能不是用这样的教室。那么我我必须跟姚先生、跟陈主任还有在场的各位说，很抱歉，也许是因为联系上的问题，我原来设想的教室没有使用，造成今天大家有点讨论到这个呃，可以再改进的地方。那这件事情，呃，我我再来跟看。我们这个负责的同学来把这件事情处理掉，但有一个很重要的原因，就是刚刚好像大家也会有感觉到那个互动的状况，这是这种教室是，你看这个椅子还是固定的，这个是一个 lecture class， 啊，那我们的课其实是混在一起，它不只是一个 lecture class， 它还有一些这个刚刚讲的很好互动有可能所造成的状况，那个 group discussion 的状况。所以我我应该说，第一个事情是我跟大家说一声很抱歉，就是这一堂课很精彩，第一堂课很重要。那么呃，我们呃 miss 了这个一个对的开始，那我来试着来做一些处理，这是第一件事。第二件事是因为呃，我不能够讲一个很长的故事，但是让我讲一件事情。那个呃，那个呃，我我我两天前遇到一个朋友，我这个朋友是东海化学系毕业的，我小学同学。我们小学到现在三十六年间，呃，认识了，呃，我们只见过三次面，一次在高中，一次在大学，那么再来就是我们都毕了业。那么他东海化学系毕业以后到美国，先念一个不晓得他念什么的一个 program，MIS 的啊，就 Information System。他第二个学位念的是这个医疗。那他在念医疗的时候，他对医疗光电呃发生了兴趣。他现在。在设计数位相机，他四年前开始进入数位相机的时候，他第一个上数位相机就得奖。那他为什么要数学数位相机？因为他在东海最有兴趣的事情是拍照，就是在拍这些东海的外面的环境。那么他在这当中也教过书，也回家好好教两个小孩子，然后后来想一想又出来，呃，投入这个呃光电的事业。那么我要说的事情是，一个人在换跑道，但是却知道他自己要做什么的时候，很多创意会出来。我今天从姚先生第一次回来学校，那么从东海毕业、大学毕业当中再回来学校，他 pick up 很多这呃离开东海以后三十年左右的这个呃学习的这个跨领域的这个知识，呈现在大家面前。超过三十年。超过三，我我想三十年。是一个好数字
。那么我很感动，那我希望同学能够跟我分享一样的感动。那么呃，大概先先说到这样子，谢谢姚先生，我自己学到很多。